Welcome to this uh, PCR webinar from Johannes Hospital in Dortmund, Germany. Uh, my name is Phil McCarthy. I'm an interventional cardiologist from King's College Hospital in London. And it's a pleasure to bring you this webinar today with my friends and colleagues here in Johannes Hospital, Helga Molman, uh, uh, Oliver Husser, uh, and Guido Daman, who you'll be seeing shortly. Now, the principle of the PCR webinar is, of course, education and interaction. Uh, and I know that you will be uh, interacting via the system that you have by asking questions, and we'd encourage you to do so. Uh, it does help us if we know who you are and where you're from so that we can have a more personal interaction, but if you'd prefer not to say, that's also fine. Uh, the purpose of this case today is for you to gain education and insights uh, into the subject which we'll talk about today. So if we could go to the slides, I'll just talk you through the case before handing over to my colleagues in the cath lab. This is a TAVI procedure with cerebral embolic protection, and the case will be done by Helga Molman and his colleagues. So if we go to the first slide to look at the case history, please. Now, the objectives of this webinar, uh, I hope we'll meet by the end of the transmission, but we would like you to participate in this session uh, to help you uh, understand the current evidence for cerebral protection to learn which patients may benefit from this cerebral protection system, and also to plan and perform uh, the TAVI procedure using the Sentinel device. I would also like you to learn about the anatomical eligibility and procedural aspects regarding the accurate NEO uh, transcatheter heart valve. So there's a lot of ground to cover here. Today's case is an 81-year-old lady who is a fairly typical TAVI case. She's a small lady who is frail, only weighs 40 kilograms, and she presents with a fairly classical story for uh, critical aortic stenosis with exertional shortness of breath and syncope. She's pretty, pretty well uh, throughout her life. She has a past history of pulmonary embolism uh, and systemic hypertension, and she has normal renal function for a lady of her age. Her non-invasive evaluation uh, confirms the diagnosis of important aortic stenosis. You'll see from the echo image on the left there that she has a bulky, calcified, and critically stenosed aortic valve. There is global left ventricular systolic impairment with an ejection fraction between 40 and 45%. And you can see from the Doppler traces on the right uh, that she certainly has very important aortic stenosis with a late peak in these uh, Doppler velocity signals um, with a peak and mean gradient of 55 and 30 and an estimated aortic valve area of nearly 0.6 centimeters squared. Her coronary angiogram uh, shows fairly non-obstructed normal coronary arteries. She has a left dominant system and the right coronary artery, you can see from the right hand image, uh, is non-dominant and small. The CT analysis shows a fairly circular aortic valve annulus. Uh, and you can see that the um, perimeter derived diameter of this annulus uh, is just under 22 uh, millimeters with a perimeter of 69 millimeters. And you can see that the left main coronary artery uh, is about 10 millimeters above the aortic annulus, which is a little borderline, but there is a reasonable size sinus at the, si at the site of this left main coronary ostium and no bulky leaflets. So the, the chance of coronary obstruction here uh, is, is low. Um, the right coronary artery is not so important uh, given that it's non-dominant and small. The CT scan also shows that the valve is tricuspid and there's a fairly symmetrical distribution of calcification on the cusps. The calcium score is 2043, which is not hugely high, but of course it is a small valve in a small patient. And we think this is compatible with important and significant aortic stenosis. 
And you can see on the right side also that the implantation projection uh, shows a fairly vertical annulus, uh, a horizontal aortic root, uh, and my colleagues will come back uh, to this point with regards to some technical tips and tricks about which device to choose with this um, horizontal aorta. Uh, analysis with the CT scan of the access shows good caliber um, femoral and iliac arteries. The bifurcation on the right side is quite high. It's significantly above the right femoral head. Uh, the bifurcation on the left side is lower and more suitable for a percutaneous approach. You can see that the vessels are fairly free of calcification. A little tortuous, but nothing that you wouldn't expect to see in this kind of patient. So a suitable case uh, for a transfemoral uh, TAVI um, procedure. Uh, and in summary, uh, we have a patient who has a logistic Euro score of 12.3% and an STS score of 3.1%. This is a little low, and, but, but combined with her very light body weight and frailty, uh, she falls into the intermediate risk category. Uh, the local heart team um, decided that a transfemoral TAVI was the most appropriate treatment for a patient with this profile. So I'd like now to hand over to my colleagues in the cath lab who will talk you through some of the technicalities of the procedure, their procedural strategy, and some of the, uh, the um, equipment they're going to be using. Uh, Helga, I can see you nice and clearly. Hello, thank you, Phil. Uh, welcome to the uh, hybrid OR in the Central Hannes Hospital in Dortmund. Um, so you heard about the case already. Um, we are pretty um, good to go. Um, before we do so, we would like to um, make you familiar with, uh, with the steps which um, are planned for this procedure, and Oliver will be so nice to introduce um, to the technical aspects. Thank you, Helga. Okay, so I need the slides, please. So if we have the first slide, please. Can we go back to the slide, uh, Nick? Slides are coming there. Okay, the previous slide, please. Okay. So I would like to uh, explain the strategy. First, we do an, a serial protection using the Sentinel device. Next slide, please. This is a, a filter device uh, collecting debris from the brachiocephalic trunk and the left ca uh, carotid artery. It's introduced via six French right radial access. And um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we chose so because there's accumulating evidence that neuroprotection in TAVI may be beneficial. Next slide. You see here the uh, anatomy of this lady, which is um, suitable for doing the Sentinel device. Next slide. And after this, we will uh, proceed putting a closure device, a suture-based uh, closure device, a Proster XL. We will uh, cross the aortic valve uh, retrogradely using a Tirumo stiff wire over an amplitude left one. We're going to exchange the um, wire uh, um, with a Safari 2 XS wire because she's a small lady. And then we're going to introduce the Ice Leaf 2 uh, for uh, working. Uh, Next step will be the balloon valvuloplasty using a 20 millimeter balloon followed by the deployment of the THV. And after that, we're gonna uh, retrieve the sentinel, sentinel system. We're gonna uh, take a look at what we have uh, captured and then close the uh, intervention site. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, before we, we conclude, I've already had a question, which is an excellent question uh, which may may just bring in Helga to, to help us here. The question from, from the audience so far is, why is Accurate suitable for a horizontal aorta compared to other TAVI devices? Of course, other TAVI devices uh, may be suitable as well, but um, the Accurate device is uh, very easy to handle because um, there are some um, stabilization arches which help to self-align um, the valve during um, the release. And therefore, it's um, very easy to handle um, horizontal orders, which sometimes are a little bit cumbersome um, using mm. other devices. You will see later on how easy um, it is to find um, the perfect um, placement of, of the device um, in this Fantastic. anatomy. So if we just go back to these slides, Nick, uh, just to conclude. 
Ah, sorry. And uh, this uh, shows the um, dimensions of the aortic annulus. You see, like said before, the perimeter-derived uh, diameter is roughly 22 millimeters. So this uh, ne next slide, please, would uh, uh, give us the dimensions of the um, small or 23 millimeter device. And so basically, we can. So we're comfortably within the um, the uh, framework for the for the yeah. smaller device. There's no controversy about the sizing here. No, we're just right in the center, so uh, we we don't worry about the dimensions here. It's okay. okay. Then we come back to the key objectives of this uh, live case. Um, you saw the case. You saw some details. Um, we are planning to do this live case in order to um, understand. Can we go back to the slide, please? We just cut, okay, thank you, to understand the current evidence of cerebral uh, protection. And you already heard some details from Oliver. We will discuss this later on. Uh, we would like you to learn uh, which patients may benefit most from the cerebral protection. We'd like to show how to plan and perform the cerebral protection during the TAVI case um, using the Sentinel device. And last but not least, to learn about the anatomic eligibility and procedural aspects um, regarding the accurate um, NEO DHF. To do so, we prepared a little bit here already. Um, so we have um, a couple of sheaths already placed. Uh, we decided to go for the vascular axis for the big sheath on the left side, um, as uh, was discussed before. So we have on the right side, a, a venous sheath and an arterial sheath. So we use a long venous sheath, which is then also um, a central axis for um, the anesthesia team. We have a seven French um, arterial sheath in there to use um, for uh, blood pressure management and to um, um, hold the pigtail, um, which we already placed at the bifurcation. On the left-hand side, we placed a venous sheath together with a pacemaker which we will uh, need later on for the valvuloplasty. What we are going to do next is to visualize um, the left groin and to um, see or to, to find the perfect um, point for the uh, puncture of um, the vessel. Okay, finish. No. Okay, let's go. Okay, here you can appreciate that also on the left side we have a pretty high bifurcation, and uh, we try to get the puncture um, above the bifurcation but below um, the um, retroperitoneal space. So what we are doing to right now is to do the puncture visualized as you can see here so this would be a good place here uh, Everything pretty small. It's okay. Okay. So, so that wire is running nicely, Helga, there. I, 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 I think lots of people have different ways of doing access. Uh, you're using X-ray. We always use uh, ultrasound. I guess it's what you're comfortable with and happy with. Yeah, that's, that's the way we go. I think there is no clear advantage for the one or the other um, yeah, I way. And um, I like this um, way of direct puncture. Uh, we had a couple of months where we used um, the ultrasound as well, um, but we came back to this um, 
ESA um, way here, and we are happy with that. Yeah. What I do right now is to have a, a small um, incision here. Uh, that's why, because I'm always using the ProStar system, um, and for the ProStar system, we need to dissect a little bit um, the tissue down to the vessel. And for this purpose, we first put in a dilator, and we use this then to dissect um, the vessel. We have some local anesthesia in place because the patient, of course, is awake. Therefore, we have to be a little bit careful here not to cause harm. Yeah. I have a couple of good questions coming in about the Sentinel, but I'm deliberately keeping them back because I know you're going to show us how to put that in now. So this is a very interesting educational part uh, of the access to prepare the groin first for the ProStar. I think it's maybe more important for the ProStar than it is for ProGlides, this, this preparation down onto the vessel. Absolutely. I think it's absolutely key to um, dissect um, the, the tissue really down to the vessel. Otherwise, um, it will be hard to um, get the knots um, close to the uh, vessel afterwards. And therefore, yeah. I really take, me, take some time here to carefully dissect um, the tissue. And um, of course, in this thin lady, it's not so hard. Sometimes it's really um, a little bit cumbersome. This is not the case here. And I think we are done already. So we remove this introducer and exchange it for the ProStar system, which comes right now. Before we introduce the ProStar, it's important to have heparin on board and to check for the ACT, um, which we are doing right now. It's important to have heparin on board because you will see in a second that there is a marker channel, and if there is no heparin, okay, um, it's often difficult to see whether we are really in the artery or not. So okay. I, I go forward carefully with the system, and once I'm in the vessel, I can see an arterial back bleed in this yep. channel. It's not the case right now. Therefore, I have to work a little bit more on the system. I'm still not entirely happy with that. Now we are getting there. Now you can see the arterial back bleed yeah. here. We can see that clearly, yeah. Okay. Then I can fire the needles and they are coming here. This gives us two um, different sutures, which will then help to close the vessel afterwards. Don't want to hurt anybody here. <laughs> so there are four needles that you're retrieving from the device. Exactly. Here. Four needles. I think m probably most people use the ProGlide, but the people that do use the ProStar and use it um, at high volume are usually very happy with it. I think it's, there's probably more of a learning curve with the ProStar than with the, uh, the ProGlides. I think that's exactly um, um, the right point. I'm, I'm convinced that I'm a little bit old-fashioned with the ProStar, but uh, the, uh, my experience is actually a little bit better. Um, probably to, due to my own personal learning curve. Yeah. Um, but I think um, you should always use the system you're most familiar with. So now we have um, these sutures here, green and the white on the other side. Check whether they are in the vessel, which is the case. And then secure the sutures with a some in first two. Okay, now we can retrieve um, the system and bring back in um, a wire. 
And you then leave the sutures there for later on for when you remove your sheath. Exactly. This is just preparatory work. Uh, the ProStar system itself is 10 French, and we usually exchange it to an 11 French sheath in order to guarantee that there is no back bleeding during yeah. um, the procedure. Um, it's sometimes a little bit better to have a slightly larger sheath in comparison to the um, ProStar system. Yeah, sure. Therefore, here comes the yellow 11 French sheath. Perfect. Good. Now we have the exterior access. So we have all access we need, and we then go to an unplugged left catheter um, in order to um, get over the um, aortic valve. And before we do so, we would like to place the um, protection device. We have a so this a is a this this is a good time to to ask you, Helga. I've got four questions coming in. There's clearly a lot of interest in this. Yeah. Um, it's it's the first question is do 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 you routinely use cerebral protection in your TAVI patients uh, as a as a matter of routine? Yeah. Actually, of course, we do not use it in all patients, but we use it in a growing number of patients. Um, Oliver already showed you that there is um, some good evidence. Um, that there is a reduction in stroke rate when you use uh, the cerebral protection device. And therefore, we have this increasing rate um, of um, cerebral protection. What, what percentage of patients do you think in Europe are getting embolic um, protection devices? What percentage of TAVI procedures are being done with cerebral protection? This is a question again from the audience. Actually, this is a very difficult question and I only have got... I, I think I don't know the answer uh, myself. Um, it depends on I the center. I know some centers are using yeah. them in 100%, but most are yeah. not. Yeah. Gut feeling would be uh, around uh, 20%, but uh, yeah. it, it may be wrong. It may be wrong. So, so perhaps I can shortly demonstrate the device before I uh, bring it in. Um, so th this is uh, the handle uh, which helps to bring in the two filters. Um, I have here the catheter, and I have a coronary wire um, which uh, directs the device um, through the um, radial axis um, towards the aorta. So we bring back the wire. Okay, now we can proceed with the wire. Is it running easily? Okay. Then we bring in the, in the device. So, so perhaps I could ask uh, Oliver and allow Helga to concentrate on, on what he's doing. Oliver, um, if you don't use the Sentinel in all your patients, how do you choose which ones get the Sentinel device? This is another question coming in. Yeah, this is an important question. I think uh, key in this is to really determine who benefits and who doesn't. I think uh, one indication for using uh, the Sentinel device would be like a severely... Um, uh, atheroma burden on the on the aortic arch, or if you have a patient who has a, um, a thrombus in the LAA that doesn't go away uh, on an, uh, anticoagulation, yeah. in valve and valve procedures, it has been shown by uh, in 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 some studies that uh, they are very prone to to release some some debris. So so this would be some some indications I would I would guess are, are in favor of using uh, the Sentinel. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps a very very heavily uh, calcified or bulky valve yeah. with with friable mobile masses on exactly. the valve as well. You sometimes yeah. see this. Um, perhaps I can shortly interrupt you. Sorry. Um, perhaps have you seen that there um, is quite some kinking here in the brachial artery, so it was not so easy to uh, bring the device uh, towards the aortic arch. But now we are pretty much uh, there. Um, I pull back the wire a little bit and bring forward now the device. We are in a slight LAO 
projection in order to see the um, orta completely. And perhaps I can show you with the, with the wire here. Um, this is how the um, the arch is um, situated. Um, therefore, yeah. I go a little bit further. Um, this would be the perfect placement for um, the first um, filter. Okay, we take back this wire here and then start with releasing first filter as you can see right here first filter opens okay this was the first step now of course we have to bend the whole system you can see uh, the system shows towards the aortic valve but we would like to protect not the aortic valve obviously but the carotid artery therefore we have to bend the system and therefore um, we turn on the second knob here, as you can see now, and it will then um, bend the whole system, as you can see here. So, try to get, no, I can't um, get there right now. So bring back the system a little bit. And so again, while Helga is working here, Oliver, I, I've had a very good question from the audience here that if your father were to have a TAVI, would you insist on embolic protection? Yeah, uh, we get, I've heard this question a lot. Uh, um, when when you when you think about it, I would I would uh, surely say yes because you see what what's inside. We found some some uh, large debris which can't be healthy if this goes into the brain. But I would also yeah. ask the operator if he has experience with it, so so that I would uh, I would say um, I, uh, yes to the question. And I guess it feeds into some other questions that we've had is the anatomic suitability. Uh, your, your CT at the beginning showed very nice conventional uh, aortic arch anatomy with non-atheromatous vessels. So I think the risk here is, is low, isn't it? Because of the uh, very clean conventional anatomy here. Sometimes you get a lot of calcified atheroma yes. uh, at the ostium of the brachiocephalic artery and the uh, common carotid. So maybe there's a bit more of a risk in those kind of patients. Of course, it's not only the, the aorta itself uh, which um, puts um, you at risk. It's also the, um, the aortic uh, valve. And therefore, yeah. um, we are not only working um, to, to protect from aortic calcification, but also from, from valve debris. If you yeah. have some difficulties to, to get in here, I know that it is very small anatomy. I tried uh, with different angulations, um, have to work a little bit around. I was um, um, not in the right artery so far. So again, not. So that's the left uh, subclavian there. Left subclavian, yeah, exactly. So now we are. There we go. Um, now we are nice. good here. And you can see how narrow the angle is. Um, yeah. This is um, due to to the small anatomy of of the lady. So bring yeah. back the whole system towards um, the carot carotid artery. I'm happy yeah. right now. Close it here, and then bring out the second filter, as you can see right now, which is placed Very now in the done. perfect place here. Bring back the wire. So that looks a like bit. a very, a very, very conventional and perfect position of both of those baskets there. And also so the device is out of the way of the arch for passage yeah, of your exactly. uh, transcatheter valve. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience is how much heparin did we administer here prior to the placement of the Sentinel? This was a question from Buenos Aires. Yeah, so, the, um, um, so far we uh, gave uh, 10,000 units of heparin, uh, which is of course quite a lot um, for, for this small lady. Um, now we are checking the ACT. Okay, ACT is 325. So That's this pretty good. So pretty, pretty good. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, then we can um, have a look on the native aortic valve. 
And here we are with our catheter. So I always try twice or three times with the pigtail um, whether I can um, come, um, whether I can cross the aortic valve. And actually, I managed to cross it with the pigtail, as you can see here. So we do not need the amplets left. Put in the pigtail again. And while doing so, I realized that we lost our pacemaker from the perfect position. As you can see here, there is a strange bend in the um, pacemaker. And I, I will correct this in a second. But first, um, I would like to bring in um, the um, guide wire for the later procedure. Perhaps I can have a wide something compressor. Can show you. Can you have a look here on, on, on this closely? This is uh, the Safari wire with a very small curve. It's a pre-shaped guide wire, uh, which helps to safely bring in all the um, devices and not to cause any harm to the uh, ventricle. It's really a very uh, a very good advance, isn't it? When when we first started using the Safari, we we thought it wouldn't be much better than your hand shaped amplats uh, extra stiff but but it's a very nice device the safari wire the way it bounces into the mid cavity and yeah. keeps everything very safe and atraumatic in the ventricle we just could see it it just goes automatically towards the apex and yeah. finds uh, the, the perfect place very atraumatic and i think this is a major advantage and and uh, contributes to to the decreasing uh, complication rate in TAVI procedures. Yeah. Okay, now we have this wire in place and uh, we go back to the um, pacing wire to correct um, this. Um, so try to bring... Okay. And at some stage in the case we can talk about pacing from the Safari wire, which I know is many people's practice now. Um, and we, I won't interfere with you at the moment, but um, that might be a topic for discussion later in the webinar as to pacing from the safari versus pacing from a temporary wire. Yeah, we sometimes do, and we sometimes do that. Um, we do not have a regular um, practice and in doing so. Still here, um, some problem with the tricuspid valve. Okay, but this, no, this is not correct yet. The first attempt to place the pacemaker was much easier, like often, so the, the wire is a little bit soft. Yeah, it gets right very now. floppy when it warms up, uh, doesn't it? Uh, but I'm not happy with the, with the position that is not perfect, therefore um, I would rather like to spend a couple of seconds more to place uh, the wire again now. No. Well, perhaps while while you're working, uh, Helga, Oliver could help us with um, uh, which patients you pace from the um, from the safari and which patients you you place a separate temporary wire. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I like to I personally like to, uh, to only pace patients uh, via uh, the guide wire who already have a pacemaker because I'm not. Uh, I sometimes don't want to have to rely on 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 on, on being able to pace via the, the guide wire if the patient becomes pacemaker dependent yeah. after the implantation. So this is uh, something okay, uh, I, I was personally doing and um, maybe I wouldn't be too confident to to use it in patients who are pacemaker naive. Yeah. Actually, personally, we have to use the Safari <laughs> right now because I really have a hard time to get in here. I just was in the coronary sinus, which and tried to pace, but it did not work. And um, sometimes yeah. it works from the coronary sinus as well. Of course, the situation is different when the patient has a permanent pacemaker device, and uh, lots of the newer devices are now uh, Wi-Fi compatible. So we did a couple of cases yesterday with Wi-Fi activation of uh, indwelling permanent pacemakers with very nice rapid pacing to 200 with no problem, and the technician was able to control the pacing 
uh, wirelessly very nicely. So that's another option if you have a pacemaker device in, in sight you already. Yeah, actually, um, we, we also do this. If uh, we, we're able to, not, not, not all uh, manufacturers allow for it, but um, no. uh, if we are lucky and the patient has a pacemaker which can be um, programmed to, to rapid pacing, we also do this, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, stop. Good. Okay, this is not the absolutely typical position of a pacemaker, but we just tested it and it works nicely. So, so we are happy now with this uh, position and we are good to proceed with our procedure. So next step would be to replace the 11 French sheath for our working sheath, which is a 14 French sheath. I can um, show the sheath quickly to you. Um, it's a 14 French um, sheath. It's expandable, and you can see that it is completely wrapped, so there's um, no harm to the vessel. Um, it's a very um, soft um, introducer sheath um, design, as you can see here. And we now take out the um, 11 French sheath. This is a major advantage. Um, you, um, the, the valve used to be an 18 French system, um, but now it's compatible to this 14 French sheath. Yeah, it's sensitive. And you can, uh, and you can see wh uh, while I'm introducing the sheath, um, it's a very, very smooth transition zone, so there is absolutely no problem to bring in the sheath. There is one important point which I would like to make right now. The patient is rather small, and uh, therefore I do not put in the um, sheath completely in order not to interact with the sheath while releasing the valve later on. And um, we check right now the position of the sheath. I would like to be beyond the bifurcation, which I'm, which I am for sure. You can see how small the patient is. So we are in the middle of the belly uh, with the sheath still um, like like 15 centimeters out. But we take this as the perfect position in order to have a um, better working area for the later valve implantation. Okay, at this point uh, we now retrieve the introducer. Okay, and then I, I'm going to de-air the sheath. It's very important to hold the sheath in this um, position. Um, there, um, the sheath is coated and therefore it's really um, easy to um, lose the perfect sheath position. Therefore I hold my left hand on the sheath and on the patient the whole time right now in order not to lose the sheath. Okay, I'm a bit of a Zug drauf machen. Next step is uh, the ballooning of uh, the native valve. And as you heard before, we are using an Ozipka balloon. Um, it's a 20 millimeter balloon, which I bring in right now. Here comes the balloon. And I have to bring the pigtail towards the aortic valve in order to get some better orientation where to balloon and where to place um, the valve later on. There was a question from the audience as to what the advantages were in crossing initially with a pigtail uh, rather than using an AL1, but I guess it's just simplicity in cutting out the step uh, that if you're able to do that, it's one fewer, one fewer steps to take. That's one reason, and the, the, the other reason is obviously um, that it may be less traumatic um, to, to use the wire and, and the pigtail catheter yeah. instead of a straight wire. And yeah. if you're using a straight wire, at, at least we do, we always replace um, the amplets left using a soft wire 
towards yeah. the pigtail catheter before we bring in the pre-shade wire. And yeah. obviously, if you're going with the pigtail directly, um, you can go with the um, amplified wire. Um, um, no, not the amplified wire, with the with safari wire straight away. Yeah. And therefore, it's, it's easy, it's quick. And most deaths which are quick are less prone to complications. And that's yeah. uh, the, the easy point to, to um, explain why we use that. First, we can shortly go to the, um, to the aortic arch again in order to see that there is no interaction with the um, sentinel system. And you can see that the balloon crosses and there is no interaction. So nothing to worry about. Okay. Okay. Now we are um, at the aortic valve. The balloon is placed in the right position, and we start a short uh, period of rapid pacing. Pace up it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope it works with this little bit atypical position. Okay, pressure is down. Mm -hmm. Pace off. Okay. I think you could clearly see that the balloon opened completely. Therefore, yep. I'm convinced that now everything is well prepared. So we have to de-air a little bit the balloon, a little bit more to retrieve it safely. Okay, here we are. Next step would be to check whether the angulation is um, okay like it is. And you can see uh, that we will have a perfect perpendicular view um, right now. So we are good to go for the implantation of the valve. May I just hold here? I would like to explain a little bit the valve, so we bring it in here. Okay. So the, the valve is loaded in this introducer here, as you can see. Um, this is uh, the distal part, nose cone, and then there's a short portion below this introducer, which is not really covered. That's the reason for this introducer. And here come the um, stabilization arches, which you will see in a couple of seconds, which will later help to um, bring um, the valve in the perfect um, angulation um, towards uh, the native um, annulus. The system is very soft. Yeah. Helga, I was sure. going to say yeah. that m most of the um, self-expanding valves are different from the accurate in that they expand from the bottom upwards, uh, and the accurate is slightly different. Maybe you could explain um, w the sequence that the valve expands in, because it's a, a unique sequence which uh, is important to understand when you're implanting it, isn't it? Absolutely. So this is a two-step approach, and it's not from bottom to top, we start with the upper part of the valve and first yeah. uh, release uh, the upper crown. The upper crown will then help to hold down the native calcified leaflets. The next is that the arches, uh, which I just yeah. showed you, the arches down here, um, will expand. And these arches are not designed to hold the valve in position, but rather to help during the alignment, during yeah. the implantation. And only after this step is done, we can um, uh, release the valve fully with a second step. There is a second knob on the system, which I will show you in a second. And this second step will then release the lower part, the annular part of the valve, and will uh, anchor the device in the uh, native um, annulus. 
And so the last movement on release of the valve should be a forward movement ra rather than a backward movement. You, so there's some uh, element of pushing forward when the valve is released. Absolutely, and the reason yeah. for that is um, that all forward movement brings the delivery system towards the outer curvature of the aorta. And once the delivery system is on the outer curvature of the aorta, we have a stable position yeah. and a really predictable release um, of um, the valve. If you Excellent. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. So what I do right now is to bring in um, the introducer. And then I can push forward the valve just 15 centimeters or something like that. And then I can retrieve the introducer and park it in the handle. Now the valve travels through the sheath. There is some force, but not a terrible lot. Of course, there is a complete loss of resistance once um, you um, are out of the sheath. You can see that there is quite some kinking in the abdominal aorta. Hmm. And perhaps we go again towards the aortic arch to make sure that there is no interaction with the sentinel. And now you can appreciate how easy the valve travels around the aorta without any um, problems. Uh, not without any problems. Actually, I have some problems here. No, oh, no, I overcome this situation here and bring it forward towards the native annulus. There was some, some force um, in, in the aortic arch, but now we are in the position we would like to be. Before we now release the valve, I will shortly explain um, the positioning. You can see this radio park marker, which is the stand holder. And this stand holder should be within the left ventricular outflow tract for five to seven millimeters. For this purpose, I try to place the pigtail in the non coronary cusp, which is not the case right now. That might be difficult due to this very small anatomy. Um, if I do not succeed, I would accept a position in the right cusp as well. But yeah. now I think we're... No, uh, here it's okay. So yeah, looks good. You can see um, that we have to bring the whole system a little bit forward. Now the stand holder is exactly at the annular level. I go forward for another couple of millimeters, as you can see here. And at the same time, you can appreciate that we have a pretty horizontal anatomy here. So the valve is more or less lying in the patient. Okay, I'm happy with this position here. And we are good to start. So we have two knobs here. Perhaps you can explain what you're, what you're doing, Oliver. So like Helge just said, it's a two-step procedure. So we have only two wheels on the handle. It's nicely numbered, number one, number two. And you see here is a safety button. So this prevents me from accidentally starting with number two. So I think I will start now. Yeah, I can start. And I try to explain what happens. You can see that first the upper crown opens, which is the case right now. I check again here. Okay, we are good above the native leaflets. And the next, during the step one, the next is that the arches will open in a couple of seconds. Here, you can see that. And you yeah. saw the jump of the valve. This nicely shows the self-aligning properties of this device. Mm. So the next step is to check again whether we are in the perfect position or not. And actually we are. I will then remove the pigtail and Oliver remove the safety button and is going to release the valve.
Okay. Okay, so you saw that the valve um, popped open and now we wait for a couple of cardiac cycles in order to allow the nitinol to fully f uh, to firmly anchor within the annulus and then we retrieve the wire in order to centralize the nose cone before we retrieve the valve as you can see here now we put in the wire back to towards the ventricle and carefully retrieve the system towards the descending aorta and now we are going to close um, the system before we bring it back in the sheath first uh, step one backwards as uh, the two backwards then step one backwards and you can see that the two radio park markers come close together which shows us uh, that the system is fully closed now we bring back the system and normally there is no interaction with the sheath so you can just remove um, everything without any problems okay the so system is out so we have another question uh, Oliver and, and Helga about whether this device always needs a pre dilatation with a bath beforehand um, I happen to know that I, I've seen several of these put in without a, a, a BAV. Um, what, what's your policy? Do you always pre-dilate with a BAV before deployment of this device? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, we have our, our uh, own cutoff where we don't do it anymore. Uh, in our cutoff is 1,500 uh, arbitrary units of, of calcium here. Um, but you need to be careful because sometimes um, even if you don't see much calcium in sclerotic anatomies you might run into problems so um, in the beginning it's it's advisable to always pre-dilate but it's it's not a not a must so you could implant this valve you could implant this valve uh, I lost without pre-dilatation okay I just I just lost my wire while I was um, pulling back the safari wire and r wanted to replace it for a pigtail. Um, actually, um, I just tried once to get in there once more to see how the hemodynamics look like, but if I don't succeed quickly, I would omit this step and would rather go um, to uh, root shot. No, it was pretty easy to get back in. Okay. So, at what stage do you assess for paravalvular leak? We are doing right now. So we are now You're going to, to check now. for for the hemodynamics. Am I the null, bitte? So we use two modalities. We use uh, hemodynamics, which tells us about the diastolic difference between aorta and uh, and diastolic ventricle. Mm -hmm. And of course, we do uh, the final root angio. We don't routinely perform echocardiography. Passer. So now we can see the um, hemodynamic and you can see that there is no gradient left which yep. is probably due to the um, supra annular design of the accurate device. Um, I think it's one of the most supra annular designs which usually um, gives you excellent hemodynamic situation. Um, especially in this small ana anatomy, uh, this might be of um, importance. You can nicely see the dichrotic notch here, so I'm yeah. pretty sure um, that the um, final root shot, which we will do um, in a, a second, will um, be with a nice result. For this purpose, it's important to place the pigtail at the upper part of the valve. This is not um, to um, to have a uh, s small regurg fraction, but more not to interact with the um, leaflets 
And because um, the leaflets are super annular, is that exactly? Point. So if you're yep. too deep with the pigtail, um, you may blow the the leaflets open, and um, perhaps have a wrong impression of the uh, regurg fraction. Yeah, there's very nice hemodynamics there. As you say, that you can be sure that this is a good result just hemodynamically. That's very nice. So that's uh, what we see right now. There's trace um, regurg, but definitely nothing which warrants more interaction with the valve. You can see that the valve nicely aligned um, towards um, the um, annulus, and I'm pretty happy um, with this result and would not go to further steps like like post ballooning or something like that. Um, these residual trays um, will probably disappear by tomorrow due to the self-expanding uh, properties of um, the accurate um, device. Yeah, there's a beautiful height there. And you can see that the stabilization arches are just keeping the valve nicely coaxial with a native valve, just as you said uh, they would. Yeah. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I retrieve the pigtail from the ventricle and um, here I usually take a wire in order to straighten the pigtail and to bring it back in order to avoid any um, interaction with the device. So the pigtail is now retrieved. And we Which have some nice. congratulations on the case from Kazakhstan here coming in from the audience. So we have a <laughs> truly <laughs> worldwide great. reach Thank you. today. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Thank you very much. So, but we are not done yet. So perhaps a little bit no. early for congratulation. Only um, half time, no, a little bit more than half time now. What we have to do right now is to we have to first retrieve um, the Sentinel. And, and the second step, have, of course, to close um, the vascular access um, site. And these are um, the next step uh, which we would like to um, do right now. So first, um, the Sentinel. We go back um, to the picture, as you can see here. The system is still completely in place, so there was no movement. First um, step is to bring back the distal filter. You can see that I'm putting on uh, the knob number three, which brings back the filter into the device. As you can see here, I close this part. I open part number two and bring the whole system towards um, the back towards uh, the ascending aorta, as you can see here. In this case, I don't bring it fully in because uh, the anatomy is so small. So I uh, stop here by purpose, and then I bring back. Uh, it does not really move. Wanted to bring back um, the curve. Okay. So. First to pull back everything. You can see that the order is really small. It takes some time to bring back the whole system and to bring back the curve. I then take out the filter number one and this straightens the whole device. Now we bring forward the wire again a little bit to in the whole system and during um, the retrieval of the system we have to um, keep the filter inside which will be done by, by Oliver and I carefully pull back the whole system as you can see here and then we are using the time for closing the femoral device to see what happened to the filters, if we retrieve some materials, we will check for this in the meanwhile. So filter is safely retrieved. So I'm preparing the ProStar right now. 
If there are some questions from the audience, we can, of course, discuss them in the meanwhile. Well, the only the only question I have um, on my on my system here is whether you have experience with a transcaval approach. I think it was in reference to the small um, femoral arteries and the high bifurcation. Uh, yeah. Do you do transcavals and do you like this approach? Um, actually, um, first question, uh, do I do it? No. Second question, I cannot answer because uh, since I'm not doing transcaval on a regular basis, I cannot really say whether I like it or not. Um, I, mean, I, I, can help, I can help by saying that I've yeah. done eight transcavals, um, yeah. and they are, they are, it is a nice, it's an elegant technique, um, and we were lucky enough to have um, colleagues from the States to proctor us and show us the technique, but I do think it's, it's uh, a technique that you would use when you had no other alternative. So um, it's for patients who are not suitable for transfemoral or more conventional approaches, but it's very elegant, and when it works, it works very well. Yeah, um, that's exactly my impression, but this is more or less gut feeling. Um, if there are alternatives to transcaval, I would always go for this alternative, be it yeah. uh, transepical, be it trans uh, subclavian. Um, I think these are perhaps um, the less traumatic um, possibilities in comparison to transcaval. Of course, there are a couple of patients in, uh, in which nothing else is um, really working. No, and I no. think with the non-transfemoral approaches, you need to choose your approach and get good at that approach. If you're a center that has very good transapical results, then maybe you should stick with that. And if you do transcaval, you should do a volume to make you good at them. I think uh, to try and do uh, a low volume of these non-transfemoral approaches is maybe not the right thing to do. So pick one of the non-transfemoral approaches and get good at it would be my advice. Yeah, absolutely agree. So in the meanwhile, perhaps you saw it, uh, I retrieved um, the sheath and I'm now pulling down the knots and um, now we can give some protamin in order to reverse the, the heparin. It's already pretty good a result without doing so much. Here you can see there's no bleeding here. I've got a few more questions that maybe Oliver can, can help with. Uh, I think the audience is keen to look at the filter to see if there's any debris in the filter that was just retrieved. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I guess so. They're still We're still working. They still edit. We're still working so on that one. Okay. Once we, once uh, we get, uh, get it done, we will show it, uh, of course. And the other, the other question is, do you have any access to any other um, protection devices? And if so, what are your thoughts on them? So far, we only worked with a Sentinel device. I think the um, there is most data for, uh, available for the Sentinel device. I do not have any experience with the other devices, and therefore I cannot really um, answer this question as well. Okay. Um, th there is another question coming in about some um, echocardiograms in the cath lab. Do you ever use uh, echo to assess PVL or fi a final echo before you take the sheaths out? Um, actually, yes. In case we have any questions, of course, we are going to have a look on the echo, no question asked. But here, I think it was pretty convincing that the result is nice. And therefore, in cases like this, we do not go for an echo in the cath lab. Of course, the patient um, gets an echo as soon as um, uh, um, she is on, on the um, ward. Um, but not um, right now. Not routine. The echo machine, no, not routine. The echo machine is just in the room, so it would be no problem to um, to, to use um, echo. So this out and normal. Okay. So what we are doing now is to check. The vascular axis, and we can see that there is a little bit of dissection, which is of course not flow limiting, and therefore I would leave it um, like this. We have a good runoff um, to the peripheral um, artery. Um, I'm pretty convinced that this uh, dissection will resolve without any sequelae. Therefore, um, we would be happy with the closure. Um, as you can see um, right now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then uh, we can now have a look on the um, Sentinel. 
on the debris. I don't know whether there is debris inside. Oh, yes, there is. Um, perhaps you can come close with the camera. How close can you come? I don't know whether Not can we come closer than this? As close as we can get. Uh, perfect. Yeah. Can you see there are some small we white can, yeah. debris? Um, wood is not huge, but then again, wood have caused at least some minor damage in the brain, uh, no question asked. Sometimes we find huger chunks of calcium or even parts of, of the um, native leaflet. Um, this is more atherosclerotic material. I would guess at least, I'm, I'm not a pathologist, but um, it looks like, um, so actually we, we retrieved some material. Okay. That's important. Then we are more or less all set with this procedure here. We have to um, retrieve the arterial access on the right hand side. And while we are doing so, I would like um, to summarize a little bit. Um, so what we did is a case um, of a transfemoral um, aortic valve implantation using um, um, also a cerebral protection device, the Sentinel device, uh, which um, yielded it, uh, some material, as you just um, could appreciate. And come on, um, are you seeing him? And um, the valve implantation was done with, the, uh, with an accurate uh, neo-transcatheter heart valve uh, with a very nice result, no gradient um, afterwards, um, aortic regurg, only trace. And in the meanwhile, the um, diastolic pressure even um, went up um, to 70. Um, therefore, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the small trace disappeared um, completely. We closed uh, the vascular access side with a um, ProStar system. Uh, so the last step which uh, we have to do right now is um, the um, closure of the um, seven French arterial sheath on the right side, uh, which will then lead that the blood pressure disappears. So I make here the schleuse out, then they don't have any So anesthesia team has no invasive measurement anymore, but patient is completely stable, therefore we do not need this. And then we are pretty much done. So I would like to thank the whole team here in the cath lab um, who helped to do this case before we come out and discuss some um, further questions. Of course, it's not only a cardiology procedure, it's always a team procedure from cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. Therefore, I'm happy that Dr. Dom, head of our cardiac surgery department, helped with this um, case here. Anesthesia, of course, is absolutely mandatory. Patient was awake, but if there would have been any problems underway, um, anesthesia is able to um, start um, immediately um, uh, um, the procedure towards a full cardiac surgery procedure. Um, it was not necessary in this case. I'm pretty happy about that. So, so we are done with this well case. Done. Congratulations on a, on a fantastic case, uh, a, a lot of educational points, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to join me. I have uh, six or seven questions on the system here, uh, so I hope you'll be able to join me here to answer some of those. But I, a very elegant case, so congratulations. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you. We are there in a second. So. So whilst um, my colleagues are, are, are taking off their, their gowns and, and joining me, some of the questions that we have here coming from the audience is um, uh, a congratulations that the Sentinel saved a stroke. And I think that there is a good point to that. When you see the um, debris in these baskets, you have to believe that that's a good thing to stop the debris going into the brain. Uh, we need to see the data. We need to move in line with the data. I know it's a controversial area. Some centers use it for all cases, other centers for highly selected cases, but uh, there is a feeling that it is a very useful device uh, and we are waiting more data to, to guide us in that percentage of how many TAVIs we, um, we do. Uh, there is a question here asking whether 
the the debris is routinely analyzed and I think I can answer that on behalf of colleagues because it's not something that we send away to the lab routinely um, but there have been some very elegant studies looking at the nature of the debris in the collection devices and it is a combination of atheroma and uh, an aortic valve material um, so so we know what this debris is but it's not routinely analyzed because it's not relevant to the patient uh, management um, let me see if I can answer some of these other questions. Oh, Helga, come and join me because I think you can help me with these. Congratulations, a very nice demonstration. Terrific. Thank Fantastic you very much. Fantastic case, and, and I learned a lot throughout the case here. So if we can get this, this screen so it's not just me, that's very good. So um, in which cases do you think anticoagulation is needed after TAVI? Perhaps, Helga, you could help us with that. That's a very difficult question, actually. Yeah. So uh, there are a couple of trials um, underway which are exactly checking for, for this um, question. Um, we know that there might be some um, interaction with in, in, in terms of thrombosis mm. with the um, TAVI device, which would then argue in, um, in favor of anticoagulation. Up to date, we do not actually know wh whether anticoagulation is really mm -hmm. the solution or not. Of course, we are um, getting some more bleeding. I cannot answer the, this question finally. There was the Galileo trial, yeah. for instance, which stopped checked early. for rivaroxaban, which was stopped early mm -hmm. due to increased mortality with anticoagulation. Um, we'll see what, what happens. Okay. Oliver, maybe you can help with this. How long is the hospital stay um, after a TAVI? How many days do the patient stay in hospital? Well, in our case, the uh, patient spends 24 hours uh, at the intermediate care unit, and then we have a protocol that um, involves a holter ECG for 24 hours and the discharge uh, echo. So uh, all in all, I, I would guess it takes four days after the procedure to, but in selected cases, you could actually discharge earlier. It's, uh, it has also something to do with the German uh, regulatory uh, system, um, so patients stay uh, in the mean stay for four days. It's interesting that it depends on the country and that there is quite a lot of difference. We send our patients home two or, two or three days mm. after. The, the, the system in the UK is very different, so uh, I guess there will be differences in, in practice in different countries in length of stay, but yeah. it impacts into cost effectiveness as well, doesn't it? So. Uh, that you know, if we it are going to make it cost yeah. effective, we're going to need to bring that length of stay down. Yeah, um, actually, this is absolutely true. At the meanwhile, I'm happy that we do not have to uh, discharge the patients so early because sometimes we see some problems um, with the conduction system yeah. on day three, on yeah, day four, yeah. day five, and this will perhaps bring patients at risk if they are already at home. Yeah. Um, We'll see what the perfect um, timing is. Of course, um, it's always good to, to send them home early, but if it's not absolutely mandatory, I, I'm pretty happy to, to keep them for at least three or four days. Now, there's a very good question here. W will the low-risk data recently released, which is, I guess, partner three and the, uh, the Evolute low-risk trial, um, do you think that preventing stroke will become more important? Or, or, or less important. Tell, give me your views on that because the stroke rates were very low, mm -hmm. weren't they? So I think there are two points. Of course, it's always important to bring um, stroke, bring down stroke rate. Um, a stroke is an absolute catastrophe after such a um, procedure. Um, therefore, every attempt um, which could reduce the stroke rate is a good attempt. On the other hand, of course, we have to admit uh, the stroke rate um, was very low, 0.4% mm. um, during hospitalization um, in partner three, which is a wonderful result and which really reassures to, to um, treat these younger patients. But at the same time, of course, it's difficult if you're already so in such a low rate, 0.4%, to further reduce um, that. These are the two aspects that have to be um, counterbalanced a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's an interesting area, isn't it? The last of my questions here waiting is, is um, I guess, pertains to the small anatomy and small bioprostheses. Do you change your anticoagulation with a small bioprosthesis compared to a normal size one, or do you do do you use the same antiplatelet or anticoagulation um, regime for mm. for all the sizes? We do not make any difference between mm. the the different sizes. Um, as I told before, this uh, especially this device is a very supra de yeah. uh, device, 
and therefore uh, the leaflets are um, moving completely free mm -hmm. and therefore I do not think that there is a special need for anticoagulation for this device and neither for smaller or larger devices. And, and do you change that, that, that with the valve-in-valve -valve procedures? Do you anticoagulate valve-in-valve -valve procedures or do you use the same regime mm -hmm. for valve-in-valve -valve than you do for, na for native valves? We usually go for three months of anticoagulation in a valve-in-valve -valve procedure. Yeah. But this is gut feeling, yeah. so there is no the same, clear data, yeah. data around that. Yeah, and of course, if you look hard for AF in these patients, about 40% are going to have paroxysmal yeah. AF if you look hard enough. So it's a really difficult area. I still think it's not resolved, Absolutely. the, the antiplatelet and anticoagulation yeah. regime. It's not resolved, yeah. is it? Therefore, I'm happy that there are a couple of other trials on the way yeah. which perhaps may help to, to answer this question. Um, there's the Envisage trial, for instance, for, for uh, Edoxaban, and um, these trials will perhaps give us a better understanding on how to treat these patients. We still have to decide if there's anticoagulation, what to do with the antiplatelet drugs? Yeah. Is it only um, clopidogrel? Is it only aspirin? Is it both? So there's yeah. a lot of possibilities which are not really clear right now. That's right. And AF will alter that and coronary disease will alter yeah. that as well. Yeah. So Oliver, for you, the, the learning points f from this case, what, what would you, you summarize to bring things, the discussions to a close? How would you, dis the learning points for the webinar for this case? Well, uh, I'd like to start with the with the accurate THV. Mm. We saw nicely how uh, even horizontal anatomies can be treated mm. uh, in a very straightforward manner. You saw that the valve aligned itself and how mm. beautifully actually how, um, it, how nice. little uh, effort was needed to to find the Im implantation position. I guess this is uh, um, a good learning point in this case. Um, and Helga, maybe you want to comment on on the Sentinel. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to, to to finish on the the valve. I mean, you made it look very easy. Of course, you're very experienced, and you make it look easy. It's, I'm sure it's not as easy as it looks, but it looked like a straightforward deployment. It deployed in a coaxial way, despite quite challenging angulation. Mm. It seemed to 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 not move as it deployed. It was really a very stable deployment, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. That's always the case. Once you find the perfect position with this valve and once you make sure that the uh, catheter is on the outer curvature of the aorta, um, the implantation is pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's a, uh, a stable system. There are a couple of steps which have to be taken into account. We tried to explain them step by step. Here in this special case, it was a little bit tricky due to the kinking in the abdominal mm. aorta. So we have a um, quite a hard angulation to, to get to, to the ascending aorta. Um, it ended up with a perfect position, yeah. was a very stable um, release of the valve. And um, I will actually um, point towards this self-aligning um, properties, which are really, really helpful in comparison to some other self-expanding devices. And how about the Sentinel now? Do you, do, you've used it, you, you demonstrate it very beautifully there. Are you going to be using it in a higher percentage of your patients? Do you feel this is going to be something that's going to be creeping into your practice? Are you going to wait for data? What's your concluding thoughts on, on the Sentinel? I would like to answer it a little bit the other way around. If you see what we finally found in, in this basket, yeah. um, this is pretty reassuring that it might be helpful to, mm -hmm. to um, use um, such a system um, on, on a more regular basis. Of course, uh, we have to handle um, the costs. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one issue um, that has to be um, discussed. But nonetheless, if, if we have a patient view and, and, and if we see what strokes could be avoided. I think this is a pretty strong argument to, to, to use it more yeah. regularly. I mean, this kind of small debris is not likely to cause a hemiplegic stroke. Yeah. It's not likely to mm. cause neurological signs that we would a associate with a stroke, but it's likely to cause diffuse brain injury, a decrease in cognitive function, perhaps delirium for a few nights. And there is a lot of talk about elderly patients coming a step down in their cognitive function after an intervention like a TAVI. So, you, I think it's a strong case to be made to look at the uh, the debris and say that's better out of the patient than in the brain. That's hard to argue Obviously, with, right. but we need the data. Actually, we need the data, absolutely, because uh, so far we do not have really hard endpoint no. data. Um, I know that these trials are on the way and they will help to, to us to understand whether we should use it in which patients, if not in all, to use it. Um, but this data is really urgently needed yeah. to, to answer this question. Yeah. 
Okay, Oliver, any other any other questions or, or points to bring out of this discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to, to make a point on the mechanisms of filter devices mm. or deflection devices. So what's, what is uh, notable about the Sentinel is that you really filter it out so it goes away. Yeah. It's not just deflected yeah. to somewhere else where it also might cause uh, trouble. And I, I also think that we should um, um, uh, be waiting for more data in order to be able to say if we're going to need it on a routine basis or just in some selected patients. There was a question earlier on which was which came at a, a difficult time, but someone was asked whether you can use makeshift um, filter um, protection devices if you don't have a healthcare system that can afford a Sentinel device. Uh, I would advise against that, really. Mm. I think that's uh, that's going to be a complicated thing and is, is going to complicate the TAVI procedure. Do you agree with that? I think you should Absolutely. use the device which is designed for for that purpose. Well, the last question I have on the on the system is a, is a thank you from from somewhere in the world saying that they enjoyed the the case. I enjoyed it very much, and I think it's just down to me to to finish the the webinar by congratulating you for an excellent demonstration. I learned a lot, and I hope we uh, we imparted that knowledge worldwide. So, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in in Dortmund. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank, thank you. you very much for bringing us. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> thank you.